of interviews on Voice Matters, and it brings me a great deal of joy to introduce you to Dr. Tom Cleveland, who is one of the pioneers in the field of voice science as far as I'm concerned. He is a professor of otolaryngology and also a singing voice specialist at the Vanderbilt Voice Center here in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he also has a PhD in music and voice science and studied with William Bernard. And so it is with great honor that I introduce you to Dr. Tom Cleveland. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Cleveland. Thank you so much for inviting me, Liz. I appreciate it. It's a privilege for me to be with you. And, and likewise, and, and just so the whole world knows, you were the person who started me off on the path of voice science. I saw a lecture, an hour long lecture at the Blair School of Music at Vanderbilt back in maybe 2007 or 2008, and it changed my entire life. I came away from that lecture thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea what this voice science thing is, but I have to know more. And so um, when I was dreaming up this interview series, you were literally at the very, very top of my list. So I'm really, I'm really honored that you have the time to spend with us. And so other people can get to know you too. So thank you. Well, thank you. And that's always rewarding for a teacher too, to find out that they had some little influence in somebody's life because that's one of the reasons, probably the main reason we teach in the first place is to affect somebody else's life. And I remember that lecture extremely well at Blair. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, I was delighted to have so many people there and to have such a good audience. And uh, it was a privilege. And that's uh, re really rewarding for me to know that it influenced you. We all are influenced by somebody, and I have those who influenced me along the way, and I would give them a great deal of credit, and of course, Bill Bernard was one of those people. When I decided to go and get a master's degree in voice, one of my friends, Melvin Price, was a student at USC in the doctoral program, and I had sung in his wedding and had known his wife for a long time through church, and we got together and he said, you've got to go to USC and you've got to go study with William Bernard. So that was my next goal to go to the USC and study with Bill Bernard. And I was able to do that because I finished my military service and was at the University of Mississippi at the time working as a field representative for the university. And I was also in the Army Reserves. And as it might happen, I didn't have a reserve unit, so they had to send me somewhere two weeks in the summertime for me to get reserve training. And lo and behold, they sent me to California. So I was able to go by USC and check things out en route to my reserve training in Paso Robles, California. And so I decided after going there that I definitely wanted to be there started the application process and made my way as soon as I possibly could to USC. My wife Eva and I got there in January of 1969 and started the program and we're very fortunate to be there. So how did you get interested in voice science in the first place? Well, when I took the pedagogy class with Bill Bernard, it kind of did to me what you said my lecture did for you. It really turned me on to the voice and how it worked. Mm. And I realized that we knew some stuff about how the voice worked then, but we didn't know a lot. And I would love to find out more. So it was really Bernard who got me interested in the scientific part of it. And so I went through his two pedagogy classes Bill died about a year and a half after I started there, and John Large came on and taught, and he was always interested in voice science and was a pioneer kind of in that area. And so I was able to work with John Large, decided upon my doctoral topic to do that on the reasons why we have voice classification as far as morphology and as far as acoustics is concerned. And so once I decided that, then I needed to get a mentor to help me further that particular topic. So I got in touch with Johan Sundberg and asked him if he would be my mentor to take me through that topic. 
and he said he would be glad to. And so I applied for grants to go to Sweden. And very fortunately, I was able to get a grant to go there and to work with Johan. So I went there in 74 and spent a year there working with Johan and developing my research topic. By the time I finished the research, I hadn't written much of anything. And it's really interesting when you haven't written very much about it, then for me, I had to go back and do research to figure out what I had done so I could write about it because once I'd finished one topic, it would open up the door to other topics and I would pursue those topics. So I ended up with eight individual topics that I was really interested in and, and finished and then had to go back and write it. So I had to go home and teach for a year. So I went back to California and taught in a small school there in Riverside, California. I taught in California Baptist College. And then at the end of that school year, I went back to Sweden for 45 days in the summertime mm -hmm. and wrote my dissertation. Brought it back after that and went over it with my committee. Mm -hmm. They approved it. I did my final work and was finally done. So wow, that's the story. That's incredible. So <clears throat> what was William Venard like? What was it like to be around him? Because he was the grandfather of a lot of our modern voice science yeah. pedagogue. I always felt like I was, I was in, in the uh, room with a master when I was there. And I always felt that I needed to hang on to every word he said because it would be meaningful somewhere. If not there for the test, it'd be meaningful somewhere along the line. So I, I was really struck with him and his presence and what he had to say. What do you think some of his biggest contributions to voice science were? Because we're still, we're still <clears throat> reading his book and looking at his charts and graphs and, and his representations of um, vowels and, and whatnot. What, are, what strikes you as some of his greatest contribution, I should say? Well, I guess what he did was he brought some of that voice science information over into singing. Mm. And it was more concrete than anything we had had before. Other areas might have been using that similar material from other people. But I think that his real big contribution was to bring it over into the singing voice. Certainly, we can't discount the video the movie that he made on the vibrating larynx mm. because that that movie was celebrated not only by the singing world at the time but the medical world as well and it became a video that almost any discipline could watch if you were interested in finding out about the physiology of the voice mm. and it received a couple of awards as a result of his work with Vandenberg and it, it was a wonderful contribution. Those are two things, I think. And the third thing would be that he got other people interested in the area because he could begin to talk about voice and the science of voice production. Mm -hmm. Did you get to take singing lessons with him? I did. When I got there, when I got to USC in January, they were in the middle of the school year and he was filled up for the year. So I studied at the time with William Eddy and I enjoyed my study with, with uh, Bill Eddy. And once I had finished my master's degree, which happened in uh, 1970, then I was able to go over and start studying with Bill Bernard. Unfortunately for him, more, it, it was very unfortunate actually for both of us, but very unfortunately for him, he had problems with his eyes that semester. And because of that, he had to stop teaching. Yeah. 
So he took a break from teaching. And along the way, he also had a heart attack. And he had to leave school again because of the heart attack. And then in January of 1971, he died of a massive heart attack while he was in, in the hospital. Mm. So I didn't really complete more than one semester of study with him, but I had had his pedagogy classes when he was in fine health. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate in that respect. He was kind of a funny guy. I mean, he had a lot of wit and would use that in the classroom, but he seemed to have a good explanation for everything he wanted you to do. That's priceless. I think one of the things that I'm learning from doing these interviews and talking with my colleagues lately is that we are translators of this information and, and being able to bring it to people to help them actually change their voicing or to learn new habits. Do you feel like he was a translator? Yes, to a certain extent, I think he was. But I think in the years of teaching experience, what you realize is what you just said, that in the translation process, you have to be ready to give the message to many different people, and you have to be armed with several methods of, that will hopefully try to accomplish the same thing. Yeah. And so you have to reach into that arsenal and give them, give that student some information that it seems that they will will be able to incorporate with their singing. I certainly don't think you can be successful in every case, but you need to have as many of those methods as you possibly can to cr try to create what you want to in that singer. Yeah, and is that something that William Vennard believed in? I'm assuming it is, but you know. I, I think he did very much, and one of the significant things about him is that he always wanted you to know that you were coming in to study with him. You weren't coming in to study under him. Mm. And on his door, he had a little sign on a three by five card that said, when it's time for our lesson, come on in. Not your lesson, but when it's time for our lesson, come on in. So he was right along there with you. And I'm sure that he was learning along with us because that's one of the great things about teaching is that you'll still learn and, and learn and learn as long as you teach. Yeah. But I thought that was a significant thing. That is very significant. Thank you for sharing that. Those mm -hmm. are the details that I think make all the difference, you know, that we're in this together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So how did you end up in the, on the medical side of voice? Well, I wanted to know how everything worked. And as soon as I finished my degree and went on faculty at USC, then I wanted to get connected with the medical school. And I went over and got connected with the chairman of the ENT department and also the vice chair of the ENT department. Mm -hmm. And I should also say, that even prior to that, I had gotten connected with the guys in the ENT department over there. And there was a Dr. Whitaker there who took me under his arm and taught me anatomy in a way that I hadn't studied before. Hmm. So I had a cadaver with him and we were able to go over there and work on that cadaver. So when I finished my degree, he wanted us to continue to do work in the medical school and in the ENT department. And so he got some money for us to be able to do that. Hmm. And he also got me an appointment in the medical school and as a clinical person. And so we started working together and I was very fortunate there to meet a young medical student by the name of Jerry Burke, mm -hmm. who was in our medical school at USC and was interested in voice. And so we were able to get together and talk about voice. 
And Jerry left USC after medical school and did his residency at UCLA mm -hmm. and then went on faculty at UCLA after that and then was made chairman of the ENT department at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I think he is just now uh, completing that position. He's not retiring, but he's just now completing that position. But I was very fortunate to meet him that way. So I've always been in the medical side, interested in the medical side and how this might carry over. And so I worked also with Bob Fader, mm -hmm. who was an ENT, was a physician at Cedar sinai Hospital there in LA. And I would go to his facility, oh, several times a month, and we would do some work together. It'd be uh, clinical or little research. And uh, I was always very fortunate to be able to work with Bob. So that's how that developed. So it's, it sounds like you forged your own path. Well, I guess you could say that because I started trying to get connected with people who were in the medical world. Mm. I was able to do some things with Henry Rubin, who was a physician there in LA as well. And when I needed a physician, Henry Rubin was my, my laryngologist at the time. He was very interested in voice and had done some significant things in uh, falsetto and some other areas of voice, especially with high-speed cameras. Mm -hmm. He and Hans von Leyden had done some work in that area. And if I remember correctly, then Henry Rubin also did um, corrected vocal paralysis in certain people mm. by uh, the methods that he used. And so I, I, I just got involved with these people and was able to work with them. Henry so, Rubin would inject Teflon in the cord oh. to move it over, which was, which was uh, totally the, uh, the way everybody practiced medicine at that time. And it was a great thing because he would put somebody in the chair in the office, inject Teflon in the vocal cord while they were there and while they were awake. He would put it laterally in the cord and he would ask them to speak as he's doing it. And it was amazing what was happening to these people voices. But then we realized that the body didn't really like Teflon so much. <laughs> and so we had to stop that, but it was the treatment of choice for a long time. It's really interesting that after I got to Vanderbilt, we had some guests from Sweden one time and uh, we were at Jim Natterville's house at a little party after they had spoken. Jim Natterville introduced them to everybody at the function and the Swedish guys got up and he said, 20 years ago, we came to Vanderbilt to learn how to put Teflon in vocal cords. Now we are back to find out how to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, full circle. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the, um, your favorite parts of the research that you've done over the years? Well, I really enjoyed the research on voice classification mm -hmm. and why men are basses and baritones and tenors. And when I did that research, I was in Sweden at uh, the Royal Institute of Technology with Johan, and we were able to get some really fine singers to come in to do that study. And um, so that was one of the things that really opened my eyes even further about vocal function, mm. how things work, and really the rhyme and reason behind it. Because we realized that as a rule, the length of the vocal tract for a tenor was about 15 and a half centimeters, 
For a baritone, it was 17, and for a bass, it was about 19 centimeters as a rule. That didn't mean that it always happened that way because there would be variations. But as a rule, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And to go along with that, you would have formant frequencies that would reside in certain areas because of the length of the vocal tract. So the longer vocal tract obviously had lower formant frequencies mm -hmm. and the shorter vocal tract obviously had higher formant frequencies. So there was rhyme and reason about it. And we could have developed a system probably then of a helpful system that you could use to help classify voices by just looking at formant frequencies. Mm. Also, you could, to a certain extent, you could palpate the larynx from the outside and realize that smaller larynges usually created higher pitches mm -hmm. and larger larynges usually created lower pitches. Mm -hmm. So it really made a great deal of sense to the rhyme and reason of it. But then we did the study that was equally significant and maybe more so in some ways on country singers trying to describe what they did acoustically and physiologically when they sang. And we found out through a study that we did with Tom Hickson and his group from Arizona that breathing patterns in country singers was completely different from the breathing pattern in classical singers. And that country singers breathed for singing the same way they did for speaking. So there was really no difference. Hmm. And then we looked at the contribution of the sound making mechanism, the vocal cords, and we compared their speech to their singing. And at the vocal cord level, it was very similar for both activities. They sang and spoke about the same. Wow. And then we looked at articulation to see what they were doing in the vocal tract. And sure enough, their articulation is like articulation for speech. Hmm. So country singing is like speech in those three areas. That gave me more courage to take a more speech-like approach to the country singing. And it helped me to develop a better approach for non-classical singing, because I think most non-classical singing adheres to that. It's more speech-like than it is uh, classical singing. And that was quite different because, I mean, I had taught at USC for 16 years in the I taught classical singing mm -hmm. for all those years. So it was different to come here and have patients here who were country singers and who did things a totally different way. I took a year, year and a half to kind of reevaluate what I was doing at the time and to discover some new methods of things. But I realized that what we thought too about non-classical singers and especially about country singers was not necessarily the case. I remember I wrote a note to one of my colleagues back at USC after I had gotten here. And you're talking and about I, coming to Vanderbilt, right? After coming to Vanderbilt, I wrote a note to my colleague at USC about being here. And I told him I was working with a lot of country singers. And he said, man, I bet those people have nodules on their nodules. And so that was the concept that we had, that the only real healthy singing was classical singing. And you couldn't be healthy if you deviated from classical singing. But we really could. And we had a lot of singers, even though I was in a clinic, we did have singers to come along through here who'd never had any vocal problems at all and had been singing country music for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speech production or speech level production of singing is, can be healthy. And you were part of the, you're part of the team that created the research to show that that's true. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I don't know if I was part of the team to do that. It was certainly not planned. 
I did the research <laughs> so I could find out what might work. Right. And it was, I must say, it was very, very helpful for me to learn that. Yeah. Then I think the important thing is learning how to deliver that message mm -hmm. to the student. Mm -hmm. Because we have people coming here who have big careers, who make a, a lot of money mm -hmm. singing. And you can't inform them that most of what they're doing is wrong because I'm sure that they won't be able to get to the door fast enough if you do. Right. And I'm sure they'll say things like, well, it's worked well for me thus far. I think I'll keep on doing it the way I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be ready to tell them, I don't want to change anything you're doing, but I do want to give you some choices. Yeah. And that can't be bad because if they're going to get more choices, it means they may be able to be better than they are right now. So at least you've gotten their interest. And I'm really not going to ask them to do anything, to change anything that they're already doing because I want them to choose to do what they feel like is the healthiest way to produce their sound. Mm -hmm. one that feels right, mm -hmm. one that still accomplishes their goal and, and uh, allows them to create the sound they would like to sound, they'd like to sing, and do it in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. Usually, after you present it and they realize what they're doing, we relate it to a cost factor. What you're doing is probably costing you more than it should, Mm. Since it is, let's figure out a way to get the same product by reducing the cost. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of our natural characteristics in the United States. If you've got a product in a store and you find another product down the way that's cheaper, but it's the same product, you're going to go to the other store and get it. So we want it to, we want to reduce the cost to the lowest thing we can because then they've got voice to put in their pocket. We don't want them using their credit card. Yeah. We want them not to use the capital. We want them to sing on the interest and not on the principal. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I'm excited to have the world hear you say that because it's a very clear, concise way of thinking about it. And I think that's what we're all trying to do you know, not to change anybody necessarily, but to help efficiency, like efficiency and coordination are my two favorite words in voice training. Yeah. Cause it takes the good and the bad out of it. Yeah. Well, I, I usually have several examples that I use when they start to squeeze and create a lot of resistance at the vocal cord level. Mm -hmm. I talk to them about how that's very similar to the way they might drive their car. Uh, they get in their car, step on the brake, and then push on the accelerator. Hmm. So now they have to overcome the resistance that they created. So the best thing to do is not create the resistance in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so don't step on the brake mm. and create resistance. I also use the little artificial larynx. So I will let some of the people use this and let them, I'll explain to them what kind of device it is first. And then I'll say it has a power supply and a battery, it has a vibrator up here, but it needs a resonator. And so people who don't have a larynx can put this to their neck and begin to speak because this thing vibrates and it makes sound and so down. And I'm not using my own vocal cords. If I were using my own cords, it'd sound double like this, but I'll stop using my own cords. And now you just have the sound of the outer bell and visual larynx and so actually. What I tell them then is that the sensation that they get when they have this and they're not using their own vocal cords the effort that they use should feel the same wow. when they use their own voice. Now, if you look at it closely, 
it's the same as my going without making any sound. Mm -hmm. And because we're not making any sound, I don't think that would convince them that it would, that it would work. Oh. But because this is making sound and all they're doing is creating shapes, they will realize, that, boy, I sure do grab my throat a lot more when I don't use this. Hmm. And that's my goal, not to grab it here any more than I do when I use this artificial larynx. So it can be very instructive real fast to show tension. That's fascinating. Do you use that on a regular basis? I have it here to use whenever I feel like I, I need to and whenever I feel like it applies. And then beyond that, I think the other thing that's helped so much is I was with Nelson Roy for a while uh, at a course in Wisconsin, and he really encouraged me to use the manipulation at the neck. Well, when I studied with Bill, Bill Bernard, he always encouraged us not to do anything in that area, touching or, or anything like that. Uh -huh. And he always told us about uh, Stanley, who had his little manipulator and so on, that he used to help singers. Mm -hmm. And I think that Douglas Stanley probably had a record of helping some people quite a lot. And then some of his people would try to use it and maybe it didn't work so well. But anyway, with Nelson, he encouraged me to do the laryngeal manipulation thing. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I got hold of it in the first place. When I went back a year later, he said, Tom, have you done that yet? And I said, no, I just haven't been able to bring myself to do it. Mm -hmm. He said, you've got to do it. So when I, when I came home, I started doing it, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So we started working with those people, and it was actually kind of the missing link. Okay. That there were things you couldn't accomplish. You couldn't accomplish these things with vocal exercises. Mm. There had to be something else. Right. And usually these problems could be solved with the laryngeal manipulation. Mm -hmm. So we started using it here in the voice center and I got in touch with the, phys with the people in physical therapy here mm -hmm. in the Diani center and hoped that they would take the ball and run with it. I told them what I wanted them to do and I wanted them to add what they thought they could do from their past training. Mm -hmm. And we had some people who were helping us some in it, but it never took off mm -hmm. until we introduced it to another physical therapist here by the name of Carrie Tomlinson. Mm -hmm. And Carrie has gone crazy with it. Mm. She has developed the field. She has trained people at the Dayani Center to do it. So she does the manipulation up here and she also does her normal physical therapy work as well along with it. And it has been amazing what it has accomplished in our singers. Some of them will go over there and spend the few weeks that it takes to get the massage and the manipulation and then they'll drop back by my room and say, I don't really see, need to see you again. My problem solved. I just wanted to let you know that mm -hmm. by dropping by. Some people have need a little, needed a little bit more work after, but um, it's, it's been fabulous. So we refer so many people to the Diani Center now. Uh, some of them are not necessarily singers, but uh, we refer so many people there, and it's been helpful in almost every case. That's incredible, and it's so encouraging to hear that, you know, voice professionals are recognizing that this is a physical instrument, and sometimes the function has just everything to do with a hang up in musculature or something that just needs a physical helping hand, just the way 
massage helps the rest of the body. And I think that for me as a, as a voice professional, that's a very encouraging message to share with clients because sometimes you feel like the vo- there's something wrong with me, there's something wrong with my voice, but it's part of your body. Right. And so sometimes you just need a little extra help from the outside and it's okay. It's not a judgment on your art artistry or who you are as a person. It's a physical matter to deal with. That's right. And sometimes I'll tell them, you're not going to be able to do anything about this on your own. Mm. You're going to have to have somebody on the outside help make this happen. Yeah. And they have to go to the physical therapist in order to get that result because they will not do to themselves what the physical therapist will do no. because it'd probably be uncomfortable enough that they wouldn't go there, but they need somebody to help correct these structures and these muscles. Yeah. And I really think that it's going to get to the point where even somebody with a normal voice and they're pleased with the way their sound is, they may need to check that area from time to time just to make sure that they still have the balance there. I heard somebody say, and I wish I could tell you who it was, but I heard somebody say one time that the whole body, the muscles of the body are just a system of pulleys. And when you pull it in one particular area, you probably get something in another area and another area and another area, Mm -hmm. and we can get imbalanced so quickly. Right. And the other thing I think that's so important is, is that we have to recognize that all muscles work in groups. And mm. when we make extra gestures somewhere in the body, then we may be employing a muscle that needs to be employed for a primary function like singing. Mm-hmm. But if it's involved creating tension in your face frowning or tightness in your jaw, Mm -hmm. when your brain looks for it, that muscle says, I'm sorry, you can't use me. I'm already employed. You're going to have to go somewhere else and find another, another muscle somewhere. So we start shifting responsibilities. And I think one of our jobs is to get the right muscles doing the right jobs Mm -hmm. and get only those muscles that we need to do the job. So it's economy of effort, economy, efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There it is again, you know, efficiency. Yep. I love that explanation too. That's really helpful. Or where do you see the field of voice science going? As far as where voice science is going, I can tell you that back in the sixties and seventies and eighties, I think when we started employing all the acoustical things that we did, I think that, we thought that this was going to be the answer Mm. to all of our questions. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been. Mm. It's been enlightening. Mm -hmm. It's been helpful. But it hasn't answered the questions, all the questions that we need answered. So we still have so many questions to be answered. Right. It seems to me that probably as we move into the future, we're going to get more information on the cellular level Mm. and that that's going to help us a great deal. And we're going to have to eventually put all of these areas together to come up with uh, greater knowledge Mm -hmm. of voice and how it works. I think if we're looking for one size fits all, I don't think that'll ever happen Mm. because I don't think that's the real answer. I think we need different sizes for different folks. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that research has shown us is that different people do things in different ways. Mm -hmm. And there was a video that Bob Fader made years ago with Mel Blanc making all of his voices and Bob put the flexible scope in his nose and watched his throat doing all of those voices. And then he had Rich Little come in and do the same voices. Well, they sounded a lot the same, but if you compared all the gestures inside to each other, they didn't look alike at all. Wow. They were different. And I think as we look at different singers, we're all different. 
and we're going to do things in slightly different ways. That feels like one of the most liberating statements about voice that I've heard in a long time. Just that we're so different and we may make the same eventual sound on the outside, but it happens in different ways. And so it's just a process of figuring that out. Yeah. Individually. Incredible. We all come with a different background. Mm -hmm. We all come with a brain that's had different experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be different too in our artistry. How would you advise somebody who, like me, when I first heard your, your lecture back so many years ago, what would you tell them to look for or how to proceed with their career? The first thing that comes to mind is I think I would tell them to get to become affiliated with the Pan American Voice Association mm -hmm. because they're going to find people there, like-minded people mm -hmm. in that organization, some with a lot of experience and some with not so much experience. But you're going to find people you can talk to. Mm. And I think it's right. so important for people to be able to talk to other people who are interested in the same thing, but come from different backgrounds. And you need to be able to bring your piece of the puzzle. You need to bring your part of the pie to the whole pie. You need to be able to talk to somebody who's, interested in statistics. You need to be able to talk to somebody who knows research design if you haven't studied that. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in the area right now is that a lot of researchers don't have a background in research design. And so it's very important that we know how to ask questions and how to answer questions. And I think they can get guidance in a group like that. And I think the other organizations can be very beneficial too, but my first one would be the Pan American Voice Association. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's great advice. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. And if, you know, I have more questions in the future, better questions in the future, would you be interested in doing another interview at some point in time? Sure. Absolutely. And thank you for this opportunity oh. to, to talk about voice. Yeah, it's, it's my, truly my honor. So thank you. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you sometime soon in Nashville, if not at the PAVA conference. Are you going to the PAVA conference in October? I will not be going to the PAVA conference in October. Okay. But I know it'll be a great <laughs> conference. Yeah, yeah, it will be. And you will be, you will be missed. So I should tell you this too, I, 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 that the field of voice science is ever growing. Mm -hmm. And I remember back in the 70s, we had a Nats convention in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and we had a panel on voice science. Well, in order to do that panel and to not upset a lot of people within the organization, Nats had to offer something else vocal at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there were several of us who did the panel, and there was another group somewhere else in the building uh, talking about singing and so on. We had more people on the panel than we did in the audience because there wasn't that much interest in voice science. We must have had about six or eight people on the panel, but we didn't have that many people in the audience. Wow. Okay. Now, if you were to do that at a Nats meeting, you would have a huge group of people. Hmm because of all the work that's gone on by so many people in the last 40 years and because so many people like you have gotten interested in it and they really want concrete answers to what's going on. And so that has brought about new organizations and so on and new summer activities. And so, yeah, it's a different world. There are a lot more people out there you can talk to. That's so encouraging because that tells me many things, including the fact that when you believe in something, sometimes mm -hmm. it may not seem like such a big deal at the beginning. Other people may not be excited about it, but there's, there's something there, especially when you feel it that deeply and you, you intuit that it's important, you know? Right. So 
wow, that's incredible. Do you remember what year that was? 72, I think, okay. Liz. I think it was 72. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so not that's not too long ago. Nope. Wow. Well, thank you for all you've done. And on behalf of the voice community, we just we just love you and we um we all think the world of you. I hope you know that. You are you are so kind. <laughs> so wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a privilege of mine to be a part of the community for all these years and especially to be with you this afternoon. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.